Hello and welcome to today's webinar from the International Trade Department of the New York Small Business Development Center. We are talking today about shipping to Canada. And I am your moderator, Jenny Alton, from the New York Small Business Development Center Central Office. We have with us a great crew of people today. We have Timothy Burns, Director of Jet Worldwide. We have Dr. Mercedes Sanchez Moore, the NYSBDC Director of International Trade. Also with us is Catherine Bamberger, Industry Developer for Global New York, and John Costanzo, Founder and CEO of LDK Global Logistics. This webinar is hosted by the International Trade Department of the NYSBDC, and we are partnering today with Global New York to bring you this webinar. We will share links to PDF copies of the slides and the recording of this session in a follow-up email. Attendees are muted and will not be on camera today. Your chats will only be visible to me and our presenters. If you have any questions during this presentation, please don't hesitate to type them in the Q&A box as they come up. You can open Zoom's Q&A box from the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window. We will address questions in a Q&A session after the presentation. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for today, but for very specific questions that may take more time and detail to answer, or if we run out of time to answer all questions, you can get in touch with Dr. Sanchez Moore by replying to the follow-up email you will receive. And with that, I will turn the time over to Mercedes. Thank you, Jenny. Good morning, and thank you everyone for attending this webinar. I am Dr. Mercedes Sanchez Moore, Director of the International Trade of New York Small Business Development Center. The New York SBDC, the next slide, just okay, thank you. The New York SBDC is a, is a partnership of the US Small Business Administration, SUNY, the City University of New York, New York State, higher education institutions, and the private sector. The SBDC provides one-to-one -one business advisement, training and research in support of entrepreneurship and economic development of the state of New York. Next slide, please. The International Trade Initiative is a special program within the New York SBDC network, which is housed and part of the SUNY network of 20 regional centers and 72 outreach and satellite offices. 98% of the population of New York is within 30 minutes of an SBDC service location. The New York SBDC International Trade Initiative supports SBDC clients statewide with expertise and experience on international trade and trade compliance. We also provide SBDC staff with professional development, increasing trade advising capabilities statewide. All of our services are free, customized, and 100% confidential. We help small and medium-sized companies become globally competitive by providing export development and import assistance through one-to-one -one consulting, market research, innovative training, and links to additional export resources provided by our partners, Global New York, the U.S. Commercial Service of the Department of Commerce, the Small Business Administration, Exim Bank, and other public and private organizations. The New York SBDC can help your business become a successful competitor in foreign markets by helping you plan and implement your export strategy. Our international business consultants are available to assist retailers, manufacturers, high technology, and even service companies with export planning and other areas such as export readiness reviews, export business plan, targeting international markets, selecting sales and distribution channels, legal considerations and licensing, logistic procedures and documentation, market research and trade logistics, and international financing options. It is easier than ever to get into the global marketplace. Many companies believe that the U.S. domestic market is big enough to meet the revenue goals. But the fact is that 90% of the world's buying power resides outside the U.S. Forward-thinking small and medium-sized businesses can tap into this buying power and grow their revenues through exporting. Each year, U.S. companies export well over $2 trillion of goods and services. Exporting works for companies of all sizes. 
97% of exporters are small and medium-sized enterprises, and 67 of exporters are fewer than 20 employees. If you are successfully operating a business in the United States, you owe to yourself to consider exporting. Many small businesses have products and services with international market appeal, but are not certain on how to proceed. The New York SBDC is here to help. We invite you to contact one of our 20 centers and schedule a no-cost session with a New York SBDC certified global business professional and realize your exporting potential today. And now we are going to learn about our partner, Global New York from Catherine Bamberger. Thank you, Mercedes. In partnership with the SBDC and our partners at US Commercial Service at the federal government, the New York State Government Department of Economic Development has a team called Global New York, which helps exporting companies that make or their product or service within the state of New York and help them grow their business by expanding their opportunities outside of the United States. As Mercedes mentioned, the most innovative and successful companies are often those who look outside of the US borders for additional customer base. You can see here that we've contracted with offices around the world, and these folks are looking out for your best interests by connecting you with market information customized to your company and potential partner lists. They will vet part potential partners and introduce you to them so that you can make your decision for distribution or joint ventures in the various markets that are depicted here. Many of these offices are contracted through the Council of Great Lakes Governors and St. Lawrence Premiers or our independent agents. In the UK, they cover multiple countries as well as in Africa and South America through a single office as the point of contact, but then each of their markets and countries has a di distinct individual who is actually on the ground in that country and able to make connections for you. We have three main services, if you can go to the next slide, three main services that we provide and the Export Marketing Assistance Service is what I just described to you where each of these foreign offices provides free information about your market potential for these various countries and the potential partner searches. This is currently offered to el eligible small business entities at no charge through the Global New York program. In addition, we have two different funding programs. One is the Global New York Fund program, which is funded through the state of New York under Governor Kathy Hochul. The State Trade Expansion Program, affectionately known as STEP, is a small business administration funded program that allows companies to get reimbursed for various marketing activities, including website development, trade shows, foreign language translation services, Exim Bank insurance premiums, and other things that will help support your export marketing activities. Next slide, please. These are the kinds of things that the STEP grant program will reimburse you for and the dollar amounts. It's a partner share program, so you will be reimbursed for eligible expenses up to 60% and up to the capped amount, which varies by each of these different programs. In addition to the ones that I mentioned, you can also send your employees to export training workshops to learn how to do documentation, export compliance manuals, or if you'd like to hire a consultant to provide these services to your company, you can also be reimbursed for some of those expenses. Next slide, please. Additionally, we lead various trade missions. In 2023, we led missions to Canada and to Mexico and Israel. And in 2024, we're participating in the US Commercial Service Trade Wins Program in Turkey with additional add-on visits to markets such as Denmark, Pol Poland, and Kazakhstan. We are also sponsoring two health exhibitions, one in Dubai, um, Arab Health, which is actually complete at this point, and then Africa Health in the fall of 2024. And we're also going to be leading a trade mission to the Caribbean. Next slide, please. As Mercedes mentioned, in addition to the SBDC offices that are located on campuses around the state, we too have a number of our team members who are based in our New York City offices 
And then the right hand two columns, you can see we have regional coverage um, out here uh, where I am in the capital region. We have someone based in Rochester, in Buffalo, on Long Island, and in the Mid-Hudson in the Newburgh area. So we also have um, a number of our team members who are out in the regions and willing and interested in meeting you and learning more about your company, your products, and helping you to discover the, the opportunities in foreign markets. Thank you, Mercedes, and all of the SBD team for your support and the opportunity to share this information with you today. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. And now it is my pleasure to, to introduce today's speakers. Timothy Barnes is the president of Corporation Jet Worldwide, a Canadian-based cross-border transportation and logistics group. Timothy serves as the president of GeoPost America, a division of La Poste Parcel Group, DPD. He also served on the boards of several industry groups as vice president and treasurer of the Express Logistic Association and president of the New York Air Courier Clearance Facility. His personal consulting extends to global carrier and regional transportation groups. He has decades of experience in cross-border trade and is a licensed U.S. custom broker. And I will also introduce our second speaker, John Constanzo, and I'm extremely pleased that he's here because I know that he's been battling some, some sickness, but I'm thrilled that he could make it today. John Constanzo is the president and founder of LDK Global Logistics, a New York-based transportation and logistic agency. He also serves as the executive director of the Maple Business Council's New York chapter since June of 2019, a networking association focused on cross-border U.S. and Canadian trade and investment. John has served in several senior executive roles over the past 30 years, president of Pur Pura Later International based in Jericho, New York, President and CEO of Interpost, a joint venture of KLM and the Dutch Post Office, President of TNT, Post Groups Express of International Mess Business for Americans Region, and Senior VP of Emery Air Freight Corporation. John is an active member of the LI community, also serves on the Lone Island Regional Economic Development Council, the Board of Executive Committee for the Lone Island Association and Chair of the LIA. International Trade Committee and co-chair of the LI Manufacturing Committee for the ESD, the New York Area and District Export Council, and as the director of the United Way of Long Island. Whoa, that was quite a bit of a bio right there. And please, Tim, go ahead with your presentation. Thank you. Okay. Jenny, can I share my screen now? Yes, please. I don't see the option. So if we... Yeah, I'm not, I'm not getting the option to share a screen. Um, you should at the not. bottom of your Zoom window uh, there. Yeah, okay, great. You're good? Can Perfect, yes. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, everybody. Thanks for the introduction. Um, so we're going to focus on shipping to Canada. Uh, I want to emphasize that uh, John and I were going to tag team on this presentation, but uh, COVID got in the way. So he's attending. He may be able to uh, chime in a few, few words here and there, but the first part of the presentation is his and the part regarding shipping from New York uh, to, uh, to Canada is, is mostly his. I adapted a little bit. But John, if you can join in every now and then, let me know, um, and we'll we'll proceed from there. Okay. First of all, standard disclaimer: the information we have for this is intended for general purposes only. Uh, we encourage everyone to reach out and listen. Uh, international regulations can be complex; they're moving, subject to interpretation. Um, and I do the best I can. We all do the best we can to, to get it right. But uh, just encourage you to continue your your outreach to seek professional advice as necessary. Again, the next three slides <clears throat> are from John. <clears throat> when he said he couldn't attend, he sent us uh, uh, some some ideas. I thought it would be good to just take this from the Maple Council. He's involved in that group. And shout out to that group. We're members of that as well. And also shout out to North County Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we're a member of that as well. 
Uh, the Maple Group is fantastic. And uh, if you want information, contact uh, John on that. Uh, so <clears throat> the slides I thought was interesting, and we've all heard it, but I think it's worth repeating, um, the merchandise exports. And I want to underscore the term merchandise. This is not services or some obscure thing. This is product. So the merchandise exports and imports between Canada and New York are substantial from both a U.S. perspective and from a Canadian perspective. Uh, New York ranks in the top 10 percent of, of both imports and exports to and from Canada. Again, Canada and U.S. share historic, um, uh, strong and, and, and large, historically large relationship between the two. It's number one, number two, number three, depending on the, on the, the uh, winds of the day, whether it's now it's Mexico or China. But Canada is always in the top, has been in the top. And um, that's just something that often it's the big elephant next door that no one recognizes. And this is uh, just kind of a reminder of that. And uh, it creates jobs and helps businesses. Uh, New York State, this slide includes Connecticut and New Jersey, because uh, John's involved, uh, well, globally, but in the Northeast particularly. Um, but New York State, uh, and I think what's remarkable about this is not um, how many jobs it creates, but how many people are not participating in it. And it's the same issue in Canada with the SMEs, the small business enterprises. Um, it's remarkable how many people can benefit who are not. So this number, I think it it's a it's it's a uh, important number. It's impressive, but it can be much 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 more impressive. So a little bit about Jet Worldwide. Um, we're the leading resource. I like to say the leading resource for shipping to Canada. We li have quite literally hundreds of pages of on our website, and tens of thousands of views a month uh, regarding everything from we curate pages, um, trying to get the sweet spot of being not too. Um, caught in the weeds and, and you know, the regulations can be, sometimes you just want to take a nap as you read the regulations. They're so intensive. and But we want to be true to the regulations, but not too salesy and saying, hey, use me, use me. So we try to to do, to, to bridge the gap uh, with the the idea of just being trust and authentic. And, uh, and that's what we try to do. And so far it's been super successful as far as helping the community to do, to do it. So shipping to Canada, as I said, the numbers are huge. It's amazing, but the uh, the shipping, the the difference to Canada to the rest of the world is number one proximity. Of course, it's right across the border. Get in your car and drive across. Um, the volume of trade. There's not many countries uh, that we do business with more than Canada, and those two combinations of proximity and the volume has created processes and an infrastructure, and that makes it just super accessible. You don't have to do um, a full 20 foot ocean container to Canada. You can run a pallet or a few packages to Canada affordably and efficiently and attract this market. So shipping to Canada <clears throat> is really shipping international. As John has, I've heard John say many times, it's not the 51st state. Uh, it is an international transaction. And, and in this presentation, I'm going to deal with, I'm going to address the fundamental aspects of international shipping, which of course apply to Canada, um, but they apply globally as well. So most of what I speak to today is going to be that. And I decided, and a lot of the presentations, because the most, uh, most of the people we speak to in shipping to Canada, it's their first foray um, into international shipping. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of the, I decided we're going to review the fundamental aspects, what I prefer to call as the first principles, the first principles of what you should know, what you need to know, and kind of um, increase your knowledge base and expand your critical knowledge of these basic uh, concepts. First one is HS codes. I'm going to review that. Valuation, it can be uh, very simple, but can there be, com can be some complexities in valuation? Country of origin, um, a lot of people say, well, it's from the US. Well, it doesn't necessarily mean it's US origin. Um, and a little quick review of duty assessment. Um, duty is kind of out there and what's the duty rate and how does it assess? And it's really quite simple and you'll see that in the example. Uh, an export declaration from the US um, to Canada. In most cases, it's not needed, but we're gonna cover that anyway, because again, on the, the whole premise of this is an international presentation, you may need it to Canada in any way. It's good to know. In any way, it's pretty uh, clear in how to do it. We're going to cover the USMCA, uh, CUSMA, Free Trade Agreement. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> once again, it's um, the U.S. has <clears throat> trade agreements with other countries, 19 other countries. So we're going to talk about the USMCA 
But in principle, the idea of origin requirements and how you qualify as, as being originating, um, a lot of the, the same concepts apply to each, each agreement. We're going to review the non-resident importer to Canada. Um, that is a very common uh, thing we see across foreign companies, particularly U.S. companies. I think virtually all the major companies uh, rely on that, that tool in Canada, and it's, it is a great tool. We're going to review that. And finally, we're going to do the shipping options and processes New York to Canada. And this is where John, uh, a lot of these, these uh, those slides, they're not his slides, but they're his ideas. And I did a lot of copy pasting, uh, little adjustments here and there. And John, if you can uh, muster up some of your, your new voice, <laughs> let us know. We'll get you in there. We'll, we'll do. Okay. Also, I want to add that um, I'm going to send a PDF. We're going to put a link to our website to this presentation. But the, the presentation itself has links to Sometimes the direct information or where you can get more information, uh, like uh, direct, for example, the USCMCA website, and sometimes to our blogs that are popular and explain it in more detail. Because I'm really just touching on it, but again, trying to hit the, the uh, first principles on all these concepts. Starting with the HS codes. Why do we need HS codes? Well, that's a good question. What are they? It's really quite a remarkable system when you think about it across 220 countries that trade regularly, countless languages, and the products across the, uh, the globe, across you know, just infinite, there is a system where every single piece can be classified under the system to allow, um, and it's a globally recognized system. The reason I pick shoes is shoes themselves, I've dealt with some shoe imports, um, and I'm thinking, man, this is, this is amazing. Um, just shoes, you have athletic, casual, formal boots, and how high does it come to become a boot? Is that a shoe, is that a boot? Sandals, flip-flops, children's slippers, specialized such as dance shoes. And then you have shoes like um, work shoes. And say you were to develop a shoe for a welding, uh, for welders, a welding shoe. Well, a welding shoe, it's a, it could be a clamp or a jig used in welding. So then it can get really confusing using those same terms. But as I said, it's really a great system and something that I think every company just uh, when you start to think about international, it's become familiar with it. Um, and the products you sell, just start thinking about their classification. It can be really helpful. Even if you infrequently ship, it's always helpful to include the HS number. Because what happens often is um, when you ship and you're just using the description, when it goes internationally, you can imagine the volume of trade that goes in. Um, often the, the importing, uh, usually the courier, They'll use a, a default one. Let's just call it that. And it may be a higher duty. It may not be right. Um, so I just encourage everyone, this is a, a great thing to get familiar with and, and aware of. Again, it's globally recognized. It's it, To me, it's a remarkable system. And it's developed and maintained by the World Customs Organization. And then there's the whole, uh, I would say books, but that kind of dates me. There's a whole database of these things where you just go through but fundamentally, um, there's a section, a chapter, a heading, and a subheading. And you take all these things and you have to figure out, well, how do I figure out my, my electric motor? How do I get that? The, so there's general rules of interpretation. And, the, and there's two, the two general rules. The first two are the ones I want to focus on because they're pretty simple and it gets you basically there. The first rule is read the chapters, the headings, and the subheadings, take them from what they are as usual tone. Basically, so if I have an electric motor, it's machinery and electrical appliances. Yeah, that's it. Electrical machinery? Well, it's certainly that. Electric motor? Well, it is an electric motor. And hmm, a motor is not of an output of greater than 37.5 or worth 35 watts. Boom, we got our head 8501.10. The second rule is the essential character. Because and for all the complexities, I think, what is it? And I think when we I work with people in trying to define their HS code, one of the things I ask them is, well, what is it? Because they'll tell me, usually it's an obscure industrial product that you don't know what it is. And 99% of people, if you told them what it was, they wouldn't understand what it was. So the essential character is really an, an important part. And this, the second rule of interpretation is don't overthink it. Just with the essential character, that's what it is. If it cannot be determined, it's based on the material or the component that comes first in the numerical headings, because usually it gets more specific as it goes down. If you can't get more specific, just use the higher one. So those are the, the ones, and I'll include a link to our blog on, on classification and how to do that. But it's, it's something I think that everybody should become familiar with. 
In addition to that, um, another resource you can use, and I, again, depending on how deep you want to go, but there's Canada and US do have different codes. And despite what I, the, the fact that it's a globally recognized system, that's for the first six digits. There are some differences in interpretations and things like that. And just to realize that every country has a different code, normally the first six are you good to go. And then you have to do kind of figure out the other, uh, the other four. Um, and so you can go, and it's a link on our website to the, to the official U.S. one for exports, um, which is the Harmonized Tariff Schedule, HTS, or U.S. for the U.S., HTS, or the Canadian Customs Tariff. And there's a link to both of those. And I invite you just look at it and see what it is and, and figure out some chapters and see how um, uh, see how your product may, may apply. Also, I would add that it's good to have that because often you'll get some to say, well, that's not what it is. If you can say, hey, this is where it is. I went to the official page. Here it is in writing. It's, it's not a website. It's not Google. It's not AI. It's not all that stuff. This is what it is. And you can show it directly there. Alternatively, and I think a better place to start, to be honest, is to uh, some great online resources. We refer people often to the U.S. Census Bureau. It's called the Schedule B search engine for the export declaration, where you can put in a, a term, for example, an electric motor, and it'll kind of uh, walk you through the steps on how to, how to define it. It's electric motor, what's it used for, blah, blah, blah. And then um, following that, you can go to trade.gov and figure out, using that HS code, figure out what would the tariff be to Canada or another country. Another tool we use quite uh, more often in Canada is, is a tool from the Export Development Corporation, find a tariff tool. So it's the same principle where you put in the description, it kind of walks you through and trying to find the correct code. And it's it, it's something that that uh, I recommend that, again, just get familiar with it, knowing the HS code. Oftentimes, you know, one of the things I say, uh, the, the concepts of shipping internationally can seem foreign, <laughs> quite literally, but that we're trying to bring those concepts home that seem them less, uh, less foreign, so to speak. And uh, again, the link to our page on HS codes. Um, keep in mind for the export declaration, and we're going to cover export declarations, but um, and not usually needed for Canada, but um, the first six are usually good to go and the other ones are not. And even though the differences can be little, it's important you get to know the other ones. We recently had an example to the UK. We thought we were right, and it came back and saying, no, that's not okay, because um, we didn't Go, go to the UK website and uh, UK HS code website and it was different and it made a difference. Often it doesn't, but it's good to know that it does. Furthermore, even if you're off by a number, sometimes it'll be an invalid number. So you, you need to really focus to make sure you get both HS codes right. A final note, and I'll mention this for, um, you can get an advanced ruling. And this is really an important thing. If you want to scale up and do it, uh, Oftentimes these advanced rulings, when, when I took the, the brokerage exam, for example, 20% of the thing is classification. And it can get so complicated. Is it, where is it, is it button left to right? Is it woven? Is it, is it fiber? Is it uh, male? Is it female? As I said, with the shoe and the boot, is that a shoe or a boot? It can get really complicated. Um, and if you're doing uh, scaling up, it, you can do this by the way in the US or and you can also do it in Canada as a New York company. You can contact CBS today and say, I, I would like to get an advanced ruling on this. And the reason that's important is you kind of keep that in your back pocket. So if they if they come back, say, three years from now, which often they can, and saying, hey, that million dollars of merchandise you imported, it's not 3% uh, duty, it's 6% duty. Um, you know, you just want to make sure if you're unsure, it's not really clear, um, just keep in mind that you have that availability to get an advanced ruling. Also, kind of a cool part of the, uh, a lot of countries are doing this now, and Canada is one of them. Uh, they have a generic harmonized system called GHS, which is really, it's meant for postal and courier imports on, on um, e-commerce. And you can imagine if you have uh, thousands of different SKUs shipping to Canada, and, um, and it's, it's clothing, which is another level of HS coding, um, it's similar to shoes. Um, you say, you know what, I'll just use this code. 9825.10, and there's rules regarding when you can use it. The key is you don't save duty with it. You can't save duty. The, the intent is not to allow um, shippers to save duty, but to give them a, a tool. And just having this, you can apply this, you're good to go. You don't have to worry about a um, hundred or perhaps thousands of different codes. You can use one. So a lot of countries have this. If you're doing e-commerce, it's something you may want to look into, not just uh, to the US, other countries are doing it as well. The next step is valuation. So valuation could be pretty simple and it's, uh, well, I sold it for $100, I'm selling for $100, I'm declaring $100. In most cases, that's right. 
it's a transaction value. The only caveat I would add to that is when you sell, again, internationally, including to Canada, the insurance and freight costs is part of the transaction. If, for example, you sell it for $100 and you ship it to, to Canada, let's say $1,000, um, you ship it for $1,000 and you say, well, it was included, you should mention on the invoice, this is CIF value. This, this rate I'm giving is CIF. It's better to kind of separate it out on the invoice, say the cost is this, the insurance is this, and freight is that. So you itemize it so customers can see that. So in most cases, it is a transaction value. But sometimes you get involved in international trade, usually not the first shipment, but sometimes the follow-up shipments. We deal with a company, for example, well, a couple of companies that do warranty parts around the world. So they'll ship a warranty part and there is no transaction per se. There is no commercial value. So what do you say? Well, it's not sold. This is a, or samples. And a lot of countries have provisions for samples, but even samples, if it's higher value, they'll say, no, no, that doesn't qualify as a sample. So what value do you use? So the rules are related to the transaction value of identical goods. So if you have the exact same part that would have sold for uh, $500, well, the transaction value of that identical good would be $500, even if you don't have a, a commercial transaction per se. And um, transaction value of similar goods is something like it, because maybe you have a one in, one in a, uh, a one a unique product that's not common. Uh, what would a similar good cost? Then furthermore, you get deductive compute and fallback method. Those, if you if you get going with those, I kind of say lawyer up, get some advice on those further um, uh, methods. But the, again, it's pretty simple. The transaction value works most of the time. Again, there's an accept, and the accept is um, it's not yet an exception. But the CBSA and Canadian they're proposing some regulatory amendments for non-resident importers. I think there's a sense that some companies are gaming the system where they're doing an inter-transfer to another company or selling it to a wholesaler who's then reselling it. There's a proposal, and this is the discussion, so I don't want to jump the gun here, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of things before if this becomes a regulation, if it does not. But the, the, the intent of this is to do the transaction value of the last sale in Canada. So against the rule of, a, of the transaction value, it may not be the commercial invoice. It may not be your transaction with the wholesaler they may say, no, well, you resold that uh, a day later for 10% uh, more. Well, that was that should be your value for importing it to Canada. That's not an issue yet, but just thought I'd mention it. And I left a link to the um, uh, CBSA website on that proposed legislation. Just thought I would mention that. Next is country of origin. As I said many times, people say, come on, man, it's Canada. Like, what? Uh, I just shipped there. And as again, as John says often, it's not the 51st state. You know, this is an international transaction. So when you ship from the U.S. to Canada or the U.S. to anywhere, the U.S. may not be the origin. If you buy something from China and bring it in and do some stuff with it, but it's still a Chinese good and you ship it to Canada, the U.S., the origin is not U.S. for the purposes of, of uh, free trade. So, But shipping from the U.S. does have advantages. The, the, the default de minimis value, if you ship from anywhere else in the world, if it's above $20, you pay uh, import duty. To the front, if it ships from the US, $150 or less, you don't pay import duty. Below $40, you don't pay duty or tax. So um, that's that's a nice access. And that was the advantage of the new USMCA and CUSMA. Um, and again, the country of origin matters if you want to qualify, like say made, grown, or raised in the US. If it qualifies as origin, then the country of origin matters. But despite all the, that stuff, keep in mind that all items from the U.S. are subject to standard importing processes. There's a rate called the most favored nation rate, which all the countries, unless you're North Korea and I forget the other ones, um, I think Iran is another one. Um, if you're not uh, these three countries, you, you get the benefit of the most favored nation rate, which is effectively the default rate that you would get into Canada um, on, on goods you import from New York. And of course, there's other restrictions regarding food and drugs and the whole land of the things that need further regulatory oversight. And those certainly are subject to more, more review. And again, a link on the website um, we, we wrote on goods that ship where they ship from versus their country of origin. Again, the resulting duty assessment. So duty is based on the HS codes. We talked the classification, the value, and the country of origin. Those are the three elements. So in the case, it's very simple, um, $10,000 in goods, transport was 400, insurance was 100. The value of goods then for duty, the value for duty it's called, is sometimes called the landed cost, the value for duty um, is $10,500. So if you say, well, it's 4% duty, 
I paid uh, 400, why is it 420? Well, it includes that. Another note is that um, applicable GST, which is Canada has the federal tax and provincial taxes, they both apply. Um, and it doesn't, it applies to the, the cost plus duty. So in this case, the GST and PST would apply to 10,920, not 10,000, not 10,500, but 10,000 plus 500 plus 420. And that's how you get the GST and PST. And that's an important, another point that um, people who, again, I've heard all these through the years, AMED's duty free. Why am I paying, why am I paying import fees? Well, uh, HST and GST and sales tax apply to all goods being imported to Canada. But that's not really an issue as far as I'm concerned, or you shouldn't worry about that because everything in Canada is subject to that. So it's not a competitive disadvantage versus the competition. Um, it's, it's something we, we all do. If the goods are to a manufacturer and they're intermediate, intermediary goods used in production of another, another product, oftentimes the importing business is able to claim it back. So just to, to, to keep that in mind. Uh, another link to the, this is actually our most uh, common page. It's one of our leading pages, Common Committee, Canadian Import Fees. It reviews all these different scenarios. Mm -hmm. Next point is the export declaration from the US. As I mentioned before, for most cases, it's not necessary. The official exemption is a 30.36 shipments destined to Canada. It's not necessary. Um, it will apply, and again, in the case of aerospace and some sensitive technology, you may need it uh, anyway, regardless of value. And of course, if you're shipping it to Canada, ship to somewhere else, well, that doesn't, it's not really going to Canada. So there's some exceptions to it, but for the most part, most of the shipments we deal with, they don't have to worry about export uh, declarations. Canada and the US, they share the data amongst each other. So it's no need to do the export declarations. Final note on that, keep in mind that when you do the export declaration, even if it's not to Canada, that you have two codes to, to apply, not just one. Now to the granddaddy of all free trade agreements, the USMCA CUSMA uh, free trade agreement. This has been, in my view, and I'm more of a globalist in this, it has been a phenomenal success for North America. Um, and for all the hula ball about, is it right, is it not right? And I've heard complaints uh, from Mexico, from the US and Canada side, they all have good points. It's not a perfect agreement but it works and it was renewed after 20 years and all the all the controversy is basically renewed with the same basic agreement it was updated to include some digital issues and, and internet things that didn't exist 20 years ago but um this is great and as i said just shipping from the usa does not mean it's u.s origin goods and there's specific requirements and how you qualify for that but as I say, if you make it, you know it, um, especially a lot of small manufacturers, um, you'll know it. But just to become familiar with the, uh, the, the different terms, one is a regional value content. Like, for example, if you import uh, products from Mexico to, to put into your product, it doesn't matter that it qualifies, it's North American products. Labor value content is one. Uh, there's steel and aluminum requirements for uh, automobile parts. There's also a de minimis rule that allows for 10% of non-origin uh, materials to be included in the product. And there's specific product or categories that have sp uh, specific requirements, usually a higher level. Um, textile and apparel is the notable exception, a notable one. Also, the cert certification of origin, much easier under the new USMCA rule. You don't need a separate certificate. All you have to do is a certification. So the certification, as long as you have this data, and a lot of this data you already have on your invoice. So if you add the other data, you should include it. A note of caution on this, if you're shipping with a, with a common carrier, put it on red lights and, and bold it and, and all that kind of stuff, because despite the, the advantage, a lot of companies don't take advantage of it. So very few imports that import on the common carriers and the express processes, um, they're not used to that. And often you could put it on a little blurb there and it won't, they won't do it properly. You really have to highlight it, put it in the system. Uh, we recommend putting a separate document, referencing on the invoice and vice versa. But the takeaways is if you make it, grow it, raise it in New York or process it, you likely could qualify for duty free import to Canada. Um, the certification paperwork is easy to prepare and include with the shipment. It's a great it's a great advantage uh, for American shippers um, and uh, something I, I urge everyone to look into. This link that I'm going to provide is directly the USMCA uh, uh, information. Next is a non-resident importer to Canada. So the NRA program allows foreign businesses to get a Canadian business number. Basically, you operate as a Canadian company without being in Canada. It is a fantastic tool to use. 
I did the note with with the uh, just a note of caution on the valuation, but that's not an issue yet. Um, but the key advantage is it allows you again you operate as, as usual and. Oftentimes, on if you're shipping smaller shipments, you're not the importer of record. If you're not an NRI, sometimes the the clearance costs can be a high as a percentage of the value of the goods. So if you're not shipping that, it, this can make clearance really a non-issue because the clearance cost is really not a number relative to the value of the shipment. You can ship in bulk uh, as a uh, imported to yourself as a non-resident importer, and then distribute it in Canada. It's a great tool. Uh, if you need a customs broker help set it up, again, one of our websites, we're not a customs broker in Canada, but we have a list of ones and also an explanation of what's the role of the broker and what do they do and how do they do it. The Canadian brokers are, I'm a US customs broker, um, but in Canada, it's pretty much the same, uh, same principles and same concepts. Other non-non-resident options, I would say, is uh, one is open a Canadian company or subsidiary. Of course, that's a high capex to launch and hiring staff and facility and other related costs. And I think for a lot of SMEs, that's not something that uh, is in their business plan. That would be more of a strategic plan as far as then it would be a shipping strategy, I would think. Um, also, keep it simple. And as a US-based exporter to Canada, you can ship direct from the USA to your customers in Canada. And many, maybe you're already doing that. Again, the main challenge in that is the um, is the entry cost. The entry cost, if you ship via ground, um, the example I have here, this is a real example, and I thought I'd take a screenshot of it and or to, to scan it and adjust it, put it on our website. The brokerage fee is 75% of the import cost. So you think, well, there's no there's no duty, there's no tax, well, there's a little bit of tax, and then the, boom, well, they uh, uh, look at the uh, brokerage fee. So that's the challenge in smaller shipping. So it's way around that that uh, John and I are familiar with and ways to minimize that. And one of the advantages, as I said, one of the things to keep in mind is by adding the, the HS code, you at least make sure that they're not defaulting to a higher um, code than they have to. Maybe, maybe you can use a code which is more appropriate and actually save duty. So now the shipping options and processing New York to Canada and vice versa. The obvious and often good choices are FedEx and UPS ground. Um, as I said, beware of the import fees. Um, the ground entry preparation fee plus the disbursement fee can be, um, it can still be worth it versus ground because ground is so much less than air, but it's something to consider because your customers will be paying the fee. Um, an air disbursement fee, um, if you go air, the, the preparation fee is included, but not the disbursement fee. So whatever they pay in duty or taxes, often it's a bigger one, taxes on your behalf, they'll charge a percentage and a minimum. I think it's around $15. Um, which can be significant depending on, on the relative uh, value of the items you're exporting. The other option is, of course, USPS, um, and that's a good option for small shippers and also some e-commerce shippers. Of course, lack of tracking and customer service associated with the postal service. And the postal clearance advantage that has been present for decades, that um, it's it's still, I think, generally an advantage because I hear people shipping in stuff with the post that I'm thinking, how do you do that? And they'll say, well, I use the post. But that advantage is lessening um, with the security and all the different uh, systems coming on. So I think the postal clearance advantage, I think it's probably still present. We don't deal in that space, but uh, it's certainly lessening. And I know that because we're getting inquiries from people wanting to convert from postal to express. And DHL, DHL is, uh, they don't, they lack a domestic network in the US, but they're a global carrier. We partner with them in Canada. Um, and it's a good it's a good option when shipping air. If you're looking for kind of an alternative to FedEx and UPS on the air side, DHL can be a good option. Less common, but off the best choice, Austin, um, Pure Later, and John worked for them in, in New York, uh, Pure Later International, uh, their division of Canada Post and Canada Post. Um, they also offer service northbound. GLS Canada is a great option, not well known, but uh, they're a European owned, UK owned uh, transportation group expanding in Canada and expanding across the US. Uh, they have northbound shipping options, also very good to consider. And of course, there's John and myself and, and the small and mid-sized brokers that, uh, again, that we don't pretend to have the advantages for, for everybody or, or the right uh, solutions. But I wanted to add that the, the um, if you look on the slide, there's a thing about border crossing. And that is a graphic from John's presentation that I, I sniped from his. Um, 75% of the crossings are border crossings. So, you know, a lot of times think, well, what are you doing? And it's going to here, going air and ocean. No, nah, it's just crossing the border. It's trucking and going across the border. Um, that's the beauty in Canada. Return solutions. That's something to consider setting up. Um, 
uh, that's something that the jet, one of the things that we do a lot for companies now, we're getting more and more into this space, doing uh, Amazon fulfillment uh, uh, removal orders and some re returns for some companies, but just there for a company to say, hey, can you receive my, I got this shipment is damaged or uh, regular product returns. It's, it's not, the thing about returns is often there's, there are huge pain points, but not that significant as a percentage of the total volume but you still got to solve them. So if you need some support in that, feel free to reach out to us. And if we can help, we're happy to do so. Shipping options and processes, New York to Canada. This is from John and he's a master at this. He worked at high levels and, and negotiating on both sides of the, of the, of the desk. Um, and uh, what he uh, mentions, and it's absolutely true, there's a lot of overcapacity now in the industry. Um, the, the volume was going up, the capacity was going up, the capacity went like that, and the volume kind of went like that. So uh, it didn't grow as fast and even shrunk a little bit, especially in the parcel market and the, the, the LTL markets. So, um, so it's a good time to negotiate. It's a good time to meet with the carriers. Invest time with the sales reps. Believe me, they can be your best ally. Um, and sometimes they work with the company and you need to help. They kind of team, you team with them to work against their company to get you what you need because they want the contract as much as you want to give them the contract. Uh, ancillary fees, and this is not just a Canada, it's not just international, it's global. Um, the auxiliary fees or the add-ons are now becoming focused on those. They are no longer incidental. They are they are substantial. And where the carriers, the base rate is very relevant, but if you don't address the uh, ancillary fees, um, you could eat away. Whatever savings you have in the base fee can easily be taken away and turned into a negative with some um, ancillary, uh, without with an extra fee. And uh, John has worked with different companies on that and you can contact John. I don't know if you can comment some more on that. Yeah, yeah, this is a very important area to look at. And many of the uh, larger companies in particular are pretty uh, difficult to negotiate on their base prices. But uh, as Tim said, if you have a good relationship with the carrier's representative, you can probably get discounts off of these ancillary fees, which could make up a substantial portion of your bill for dimensional weight, which is basically charging you for the volume or space your shipment occupies on a truck or a plane. Uh, oversized shipments, uh, re-delivery or re residential fees, uh, those are all negotiable and you really should spend some time uh, looking into those as well. I think there's lots of savings to have there. And the other thing John mentioned was uh, service enhancements. Um, and it, it, it's true that often where they can't negotiate lower on a price, they may say, well, how about instead of that, we give you a service enhancement. So we speed up the transit or do something that we can up, upgrade your service. Yeah, the one thing I would caution is that when you get these discounted rates, they're going to try to get you to lock in uh, a minimum amount of volume. Uh, make sure that whatever you commit to them, you can deliver because they will hold you to that. The larger companies, for sure. The smaller to mid-size may be a little more flexible, but if you're going to negotiate contracts with FedEx, UPS, DHL, and you make a commitment, they're going to hold you to it. Thank you, John. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Okay, John, you want to, can you cover this slide? Happy to, yeah. And by the way, I just, it's listening to Tim. It reminds me of just how valuable a partner, uh, somebody like Tim could be in, in working through those initial decisions you have to make when you enter the market. And I can't emphasize enough how important it is to find a, a partner like Tim who knows the ins and outs of HSC coding and classification and a country of origin. Uh, that can save you a ton of money and it's worthwhile to invest a little upfront to get that kind of advice. Um, you know, you, the, the other thing is one of the biggest challenges to starting up with a company into a new market is does your warehouse management system or your shipping systems integrate well with the company you're going to use? So you, these are the systems used to generate orders in your company, but also at the back end labels and manifest to the carrier that's going to deliver your product. Uh, it, so I'd start there if you have an existing warehouse management provider like Manhattan Associates, of course, or ConnectShip. Talk to them and, and see what, if you're entering Canada, see what tools they have, or you may already have in your system that you're not aware of to be able to, to create those uh, labels. Uh, if not, uh, API today is probably the most common method to use to transmit data to and from the carriers to generate labels, manifests. Uh, almost every carrier, including the small and mid-sized companies, are, are adapting to API uh, feeds. And then a lot of the companies will give you a system 
right? If not the system, a hard system itself, they'll provide you the software or uh, the a website to go to where you can print your own labels manifest uh, directly. And I would add to that, John, that the API is actually more important on international because often there's more data that you're transferring. So um, if you integrate the product and the HS codes and the valuation, so the API, the build is sometimes more, more involved on the international side, but the, the uh, payout on the other end is huge. Yeah, if I might add to that, is that uh, most IT departments uh, prefer to work through API because it's easy to implement rather than opening up a can of worms, so to speak, uh, to develop an integration uh, through EDI or another method with a carrier API is pretty simple for the IT team to support you. 100%. So New York, it's up to you. If you can make it there, you can ship it anywhere. So uh, that's our, uh, I'll end on that note and uh, merci beaucoup. All right. Just a moment, please. Thank you, team. For, yes. And thank you, John, for this so informative presentation. Uh, we had quite a few questions along your presentation that Catherine and I had been addressing. Um, we are going to provide your contact information so people have the opportunity to contact you and, and obtain feedback from you directly as well. And now I would like to open to further questions for our presenters, please. We'd love to have you drop questions in the Q&A box for our presenters to answer at this time. So find that Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. There will be a Q&A button. If you're not seeing it, you can click on the More button and then click Q&A. We'll give people a moment Okay, so the first question is, how can we access a copy of the slides for reference? So that one I can answer. You'll receive a follow-up email that will have the link for these slides that uh, Mercedes and Catherine presented at the beginning of the presentation, and then also to the slides that Tim has been presenting. Uh, he will have those available on his website, so we'll give you a link to where you can go to and download those for your reference. We'll leave a few more minutes. All right. If you are transporting food products or produce specifically, is there a resource available to help determine what food safety requirements you need to meet or documentation you need to ship to Canada? John, can you answer that one? Yeah, that's a long topic. Uh, it, there are definitely requirements within Canada. Uh, they have kind of a... An, a uh, Food and Safety Commission, I forget the name of the department, but uh, I think that one would be uh, something if you want to reach out to me or Tim, we can we can get you connected with somebody that can be of help, but they definitely are. And they're very keen on making sure that anything entering Canada is meeting all those strict standards. Um, and oftentimes, uh, one way to overcome some of the certification challenges for importing directly from the states is that if you find a 3pl or a company in canada that has a food grade warehouse and can offer you fulfillment services from there they're already certified and make it may make that easier for you to enter that market but send us some information and we'll be happy to help you if I may, um, one of the partners that we neglected to mention is an organization of the Northeast and Midwest states called Food Export. Um, foodexport.org is their website. Um, in addition to um, various market reports that they have, they are specifically focused on U.S. Uh, food and beverage opportunities. They have a, new, a number of educational and also marketing support, and um, they have uh, representatives in Canada as well as other markets around the world. Um, USDA is the regulatory body to, that covers food and beverage, and they have, uh, you know, Canada, despite being uh, have being just across the border, um, we've had a number of instances where where companies have said, "Oh, I can just drive it across." It's like, no, no. Again, to to Tim's point, it is not the fifty first state. It is not okay to just drive it across the border in the back of your truck. Um, there are definitely a number of regulations that apply, but the food export organization can also be very helpful. 
Pompeo. We have a question, so same question, but about skincare this time. What can you tell us about that industry? Yeah, it's not it's not as heavily regulated, obviously, as food. Uh, there are so there are regulatory requirements about that that you have to file for to do business in Canada. Again, uh, we don't have the time to go through probably all that, but it's not as heavily regulated as food. For, uh, we handle uh, quite a few shipments from a very high level skincare uh, manufacturer in the states, shipping to Sephora stores, for example, all over Canada. It's pretty seamless. Um, and uh, much less onerous to to add to the market. Comes under uh, toiletries, uh, cosmetic the category, and it's less uh, less difficult to enter. Yeah, labeling requirements are something else to take into consideration, though. They do have to be, you know, again in English and in French in the metrics uh, metric system versus the English system when it comes to weights and ingredients lists, things like that are also required. And again, it, things are very specific depending on your HS code, depending on the product um, that you're looking to import into Canada. And so that's again, where reach out to your counselor, uh, your SBDC counselor, reach out to your global New York representative or to your favorite custom broker and, and we can help get you to the right place. Yes, I was gonna ask Places. that, yes. I was going to suggest to anyone, um, Google the closest SBDC to you in the location of the state that you are, and then request a counseling session, and we can address. Um, also, we can do market research for every product because every product is different depending on the industry. I saw a question about licenses and certificates. Um, before starting to export, well, it depends on the product that you are shipping. You're going to have a certain regulation. Um, medical um, and food are heavily regulated. There are other industries that are much less regulated, but it depends on the product. There is not a license per se. It, it depends on wherever you are trying to export there. Yeah, the one thing I'd add, Mercedes, that's an excellent point, and, and I encourage you to work with Mercedes and her team to get that information up front is that, you know, the U S and Canada have worked extremely hard to harmonize a lot of the regulatory regimen around uh, trade between the two markets. So if you're already certified well in the States, the odds are pretty good. You're going to be okay in Canada, but you just can't ignore it. Right. You can't, as somebody said, put it in the trunk and drive across the border. Smuggling is not a good idea. Right? <laughs> so, uh, have a conversation with Mercedes team. And I'm sure, I'm sure if you're already certified to market those products in the States, you're going to be fine in Canada as well. You just have to go through the process. Thank you. So I've dropped in the chat our locations uh, as the NYSBDC. So you can look those up there. And then uh, we'll also put in the link for you to contact us to make an appointment so uh, here is that link coming in the chat right now. And uh, with that, we are at time today. And I know that there are some more questions. So we will include contact information for everyone on the call today in that follow-up email so that you can get in touch with someone to help you with your specific questions. We appreciate everyone who has been here and asking so many good questions as the presentation has gone along. And uh, we're so grateful for Tim and John and Catherine, and then of course, our own Dr. Mercedes Sanchez Moore being with us today. So uh, Mercedes, I'll let you, uh, I'll let you close out for us. Just my final note is that uh, if you have a moment to answer questions in our survey after the webinar, we would really appreciate your feedback. Yes, I truly encourage everyone, as I said, find out where your closest SBDC center is and request a counseling. Also, you can follow up with each of the panelists with an email, and then we will try to address your questions. But the best way, get into the system. We are the entry point, and then we can funnel to all of our partners, both public and private organizations are speakers, you know, and if you have any question regarding this presentation, please contact Tim and John directly because they are the experts on transportation. 
but I have seen many questions that were not exactly about the topic. So that is why I will encourage you to contact your SBDC center and then we can have a counseling session with you. And thank you so much, Jenny and Tim and John for your partnership and for providing this wonderful presentation. And of course, my beautiful Catherine, my partner <laughs> in crime always. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a lovely rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Bye -bye. Bye. Thank you.